Ruchi? As parents, everybody's huh? parents. So, uh -huh. and we want to make a right decision for our kids, and we want our kids to be successful. So that's why you can see the strength of the class. <laughs> <laughs> and you can never really get enough advice when it comes to You can never <laughs> get enough advice. Anything else? My wife is traveling, so I'm taking notes. That's a good one. So if you can hear it, you have to do self doubt that we in every now and then. So I think it's good to hear other people's thoughts. Anybody else? Vijay, you want? Sorry to interrupt, guys. We have an announcement. Yeah, is there um, a Bhavna with the student in S1? Ms. Bhavna? Anyone? No one? Okay. Is she crying? Yeah. Okay. Oh, she's crying. <laughs> a little kids. Yeah. You want to bring her down or? Maybe the mom is in the bathroom. So yeah. Maybe you can ask somebody to check for you. I know, I've had three kids. <laughs> it's hard. So somebody was saying here? Yeah. yeah there. Because I want to be a good parent like my parents. <laughs> So what is stopping you? I'm going to be a little bit more deeper with you. What is stopping you from being... There are so much changes now. You have social media, you have mobile, you, there are so many things. So many dangers, yeah. so many good things. There's always this dichotomy of Indian culture and American culture. How to finish it together, okay. how to do it right. Wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Okay, so we're going to start on this, and you're going to have, yes, ma'am. Could you please introduce yourself a little bit before we begin? Yes, I'm going to. first time meeting you. I'd love to talk to you a little bit. Yes, you will. You will. I'm going to introduce myself, and uh, so you're free to ask questions. We are passing a sign-up sheet. Uh, if you want to get more information, you don't have to answer it straight away, okay? When you feel that, you know, you want to know more about what I do, and after I tell you a little bit, if it, it's in alignment with you, then you fill it up, okay? And the last column there is for a breakthrough session. So that breakthrough session is when you do one-on-one -on -one session with me for your particular problem. This is a group session. So sometimes when you hear something and it, it sort of ignites uh, interest in you, then you say, look, I need to do a one-on-one -on -one session with her, okay? So it's only a very specific uh, number of people, so I cannot take everybody here. So, so be careful when you put it X there. You want to really, really have the session, and my uh, staff will send you the schedule, my schedule, okay, to book a session. So, without much further ado, we can go. Uh, so, we have to hold on. Yeah, the title of this talk is Conscious Parenting: How to Raise Confident, Resilient, and Successful Children. Okay. Now, those are loaded words because it's not that easy to define what it is, okay? So that we all have different opinions and how we can do that. And um, this is a talk on how to bring it all together, okay? And let's see. I have to find out where it is that, okay, let's see. Come on, just the four feet. Just the four feet, okay, just a four feet, okay. So children are expressions of God. How many of you have heard this? They have their own journey in life to pursue. Having chosen their parents who are mere trustees and caretakers. Now you think you gave birth to your children, right? But they chose you as parents. So across religious traditions, across spiritual traditions, and especially in Hindu karma, Hindu, uh, 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 the Vedantas, so I quote a lot on the Vedantas. It's, uh, and, and how many of you are Christians here? Any Christians? No. So even in Christianity, there are concepts that children um, choose their parents. Okay, so parents are really caretakers. So you may think you own your child, but you don't. Okay. So the poet Khalil Gibran beautifully summed it up, saying, "Your children are not your children; they come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you." Okay. Throughout this talk, I want you to remember that uh, we're going to have a couple of like, you know, same language that we're going to speak. So a couple of things that you're going to put in your mind. So just for now, just put it in. Whether you accept it or not, doesn't matter, okay? For this talk, you just try it out, all right? So who are the 
first teachers of the children? The parents, the mother. Okay, the mother. Who has the primary responsibility to mold the character of the children? You can shout it out. Mother. 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 Okay. Not the father is not important. Okay. <laughs> but the mom. Who children spend 85% of their time in the home and community. Who has the biggest responsibility for their development? Teachers. Yes. This is parents. Right. Correct. The answer to these questions is parents. The parents are a major influence in the development of the child's character. Okay. So you'll see where the trend is going to go when I mean that. So what I'm going to share with you today is, what is conscious parenting? The three biggest mistakes parents make to, when they deciding how to deal with their children's bad behavior. In, in that I include the children who don't want to study, who are you know insecure, they lack the confidence, they're anxious, they're scared, right? The number one reason why we as parents are stuck and unable to make the decision and take the actions required to raise confident, resilient, and successful children. The simple mindset shift. I have to figure this one out. Okay. The simple mindset shift that will transform how you see yourself, your kids, and your relationship. Is that simple? Okay, so it's not a complicated because you just need to know what the roadmaps are and how to gain clarity on how to raise a confident, resilient, and successful child. Okay, a lot for today. <laughs> okay, we'll see how much we can do, right? Um, I apologize, I have to figure this one out. <coughs> So I wanted to say here I was wrong so many times till I understood why my children were in my life. So my name is Dr. Vijaya and I'm a successful Ivy Lake trained physician, psychiatrist at Harvard and Columbia. And I'm, a, I'm from Singapore, that's why you hear my accent. And I lived a very jet set life, right? I still do, but, uh, and I married uh, with three kids. Uh, I use meditation and other uh, law of attraction. Anybody familiar with law of attraction? Yeah. So to manifest the life that I wanted. And in Singapore, anybody been to Singapore? Yeah. So there, it's like the five C's, right? Cash, condo, credit card, <laughs> what is that? Cars, and one more C. Career. Career. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and that's similar to India, right? We all have this like, oh my God, we have to get this and get that. And, and go higher and higher and higher and more and more and more, right? So what happened when I did that? My inauthentic world fell apart, okay? So my husband and I, after 20 years of uh, marriage, we decided to divorce. Uh, it was a time when I had to go for emergencies. Uh, um, I refused the surgery. I had bleeding fibroids. That was very, very severe. For months and months, the bleeding wouldn't stop. And I was exhausted. It was very painful, severe health and financial challenges. I almost lost my kids and my home and no job, no money, no visa. Okay, so this was just 15 years ago. And it wasn't that I wasn't parenting with the conscious parenting, but I just had no depth. And I really didn't like realize, you know, why was I going through all this? Because I was a good person. How many people I hear are good people? Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> it has no bearing on whether you're a good person or not. I have to tell you that, right? It is a bearing on yourself. And so we're going to come to why do I mean that? So when I was in that state, you know, when you're bleeding a lot, and you're going to understand why I'm saying that, the, your mind and thinking has to come over. Because I was in bed. I had to get transfusions in hospitals. And, you know, so the thoughts or whatever it was, the pain, the heartfelt emotions, they just had to come down. You know, so you're watching a life is slipping away. And I refused the surgery because in my, in my mother's and my, my aunt's life, when they did the surgery, they suffered so much of post-surgical uh, complications. Any physicians here? No. So it's what doctors don't tell you, right? But I, as a physician, and I knew what my parent, my mother uh, suffered through, I didn't want the surgery. And when I was meditating, I just got that, you know, that there is another way. So I had to go through all that I had to go through. But the most important thing was looking at the faces of my three children. 
they were shocked, they were scared. Their father wanted to take them to China at that time. You know, they were living their comfortable, you know, uh, family uh, uh, home here in, in New York, in Bedford. So we had come here about, oh, in 1997. And before that, we had been a year in Boston. So the children were Americanized, right? So you can imagine when you want to take them back, even to Singapore, I was torn. My husband wanted to go back to Singapore. I said, no, the education, especially my eldest son, and you're gonna hear about him in a while, uh, he was a dreamer. Anybody who has a dreamer child or know of a dreamer child that won't pass up homework? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he's intelligent, but he's always in a daydream of his own. Well, suffice to say, he's a lawyer now. <laughs> and he wants to run everybody's life. But he needed the atmosphere, the environment to bring him up. And I felt that where we were, the school system was much better than in Singapore. Okay, so it was a, was a decision that I had to make. The other two children I was not worried about. So I was determined, I said, you know, they're lying with that bleeding and that, you know, that, that stress that was coming. I said, what do I do? You know, how do I do it? And because the blood was all going, because my hemoglobin was six at that time, uh, I just felt there must be a safer way, there's a more authentic way to do this, okay? And so I woke up and now, you know, I'm an author, I have my Jiva supplements, I created the supplements and within a year, I found the supplements that I created, and because I'm doing deep meditation, it just had a download, and I could heal myself. And uh, that's my youngest son, the center, and uh, his graduation, and that's our little dog, uh, Bianca, and the three kids and I in Philly, my two boys are in Philly, and that's my life partner now, Dominique, and those are three of my kids. The youngest one, Mikhail, is getting married in a couple of weeks. Okay, This was not the state, it was 14, 15 years ago. So the points that I'm saying here are heartfelt, and uh, what helped to road the uh, uh, to light up the road where to go, what to do. Okay. So I found the secret I felt to life because when you can raise your children to be confident, resilient, and successful, you have to look deep inside yourself. So it's not about the kids; it's about you, us as parents. So it's transitioning versus transformation. How do you transform something that is so impossible situation? So what, what happened was that the conscious parenting was what I discovered through human values. Anybody heard of human values? A few people, right? So Satya, Dharma, Shanti, Prema, Ahimsa. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit more, a little bit uh, in this. Satya is truth. That's your road map. The greatest truth is we are one. So when a child, you know, uh, is, is, uh, is when you feel competition and you feel greedy, you want to take things from other people, uh, that means you are not honoring that we are all one. Whether you have hurt somebody else in thought, word, or deed, it's going to come around. And your children learn from your actions and behavior and, you know, words. So Satya is very important. Under Satya, in each of these five human values, there are hundreds and hundreds of categories of values. So the Dharma is the right action. It's, it's even much bigger than right action. But each moment of our life, there is a Dharma that our conscience would correct us to. So when we adhere to that, and most of us in our families, you know, the gentleman who said, I want to raise my kids like my parents did, a lot of us have that imbibed in us, and we don't even realize it. Uh, Shanti is peace. Right? Ahimsa is non-violence. And non-violence in thought, word, or deed. So when we criticize our children, when we criticize ourselves, it's violence. Okay? I didn't know that. Because I used to beat myself up so much. Any people here beat themselves up so much self-criticism? <laughs> Thank you for being honest. I'm sure everybody in the room too. So that is, uh, uh, we have to transform that part of us. Okay? Because when you criticize yourself, you're criticizing the divine part in all of us. Mm -hmm. So when you criticize a child, when you want to correct a child, mm -hmm. that is a way to do it with love, okay? Love is the glue to everything. This prema that I'm talking about is unconditional love. Unconditional <coughs> accepting of the child, even though you don't agree with what the child is doing at the moment or being with the moment, you have to accept and be connected to the child. Before you can discipline the child, the connection has to be there. Is everyone clear on this? And the connecting is through love. So sometimes we are so busy as parents, we're running around and we, we wonder why the child is bugging us and not doing the work that we ask them to do.
but we have to take a moment as I'm going to show you here the child is functioning at whatever age that they are and you know it might be a need for hunger it might be a need for a hug from you it might be something else that's causing the unruly bad behavior so you as a parent you have to check in you got to go beyond your frustration beyond your anger beyond your worry and find out what is happening and how can we do that the five human values are a guidepost okay so what is this got a mind of his own. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Like a no. Yes. So I like this, the harmony house of human values. Love encompasses it all. It's above us, below us, and all around us. Now, this is not permissive love. Okay? This is self-discipline. That is, this is called discipline with love. It's called tough love. Okay? But the toughness is the child knows you care. So there is a distinction between that. And the roof of the house is non-violence, but the foundation is truth, the basis of right conduct, okay? Because if you don't have truth, you don't have anything, you don't have a foundation. And the, 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 the side of the house, the walls of the house is genuinely right conduct, and the other side limits and rules and boundaries. How can you do that? And peace will dwell in that house. And where there's peace in that house, there is harmony in the home. And where there's harmony in the home, there is uh, how many peace in the community and in the in the family in the community and where there's community there is peace in the community there is harmony in the nation so we always start with the individual and then you go into your family and see you know so you are as parents we as parents we are always like checking in to see how how we are doing on love and truth and right action and peace and non-violence okay so conscious parenting is just something pointing in the right direction it's also called mindful parenting, unconditional parenting, positive parenting, attachment parenting, gentle parenting, intuitive parenting. You can go on and on and on and on. So it's just here pointing a direction what we do. And if you bear in mind about the human values, you've got it, right? And you won't be far off. Whatever your religious faith basis or spiritual, you know, you can talk to anybody from any faith, any status in life, okay? Wherever they come from. Because the human values, it's, it's really deep in each human uh, person, okay? So conscious parenting is being the loving, life-giving torch that helps children stay on the path, being home to themselves. So having a child not obey rules because externally we can like, you know, impound, impound ourselves and impose the rule, but actually taking the time to talk to the child and finding out what the child understands by that rule, by that discipline, and why the child thinks it's important. Okay, so there are certain ways that you know we can connect to the child, and a way of being in the world with yourself and your children that is characterized by unconditional love. So if you beat yourself up much, you cannot have unconditional love for yourself. So that is why when when uh, I'll tell you how you know when when you don't have love and freedom for yourself, peace, kindness, and clarity of mind, and you're stressed out we are going to bring that stress to our children, which I found out that I was doing. As much as I love them, as much as I try to, to help them, but running around 36 hour call duties and pushed around for all the social engagements and media and all kinds of things in my job uh, and, and, and personal life, uh, that wasn't being much help. And in Singapore especially, uh, you know, they, 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 we had two servants, two housekeepers. And the children, after they come back from school till evening, no matter how small they were, they were always tutors. Okay, so that was not that was like the drive after drive, the driving the children to the ground. And especially if your children are like slow, you know, s slow dreamers, or you know, it, it's very tough. It's very very tough for them, right? So we have to balance it. So what is the balance? The key that I put this slide is it's important to respect your parents. Most, most parents I see and do, and I've, I've been uh, um, uh, subject to that as well. I treat my kids, you know, in the hope that ultimately they will respect me, right? By giving them cons uh, materialistic things, right? Giving them, you know, all the things that they want, oh, this Barbie doll or this train set and everything. Because we love them and we want to go into a bigger home, we want to do bigger cars and, you know, all the time the child is seeing the parents as a, as a symbol of materialism. Oh, I can get things. And we equate love with buying things. Anybody familiar with that? Yeah. So thank you for being honest. 
So we do that consistently, unconsciously, unwittingly, unknowingly. We think that it's better to keep them quiet, better to reward them. So I'm going to see whether we have time to talk about that. That respect is actually sitting down with your child to tell, you know, this may not be a good thing. And because they're seeing the advertising, right? And they wanted all their children in school have a better iPhone or better toy and they must also have it, right? So it's how do you talk to a child and what do you do to sort of bring some balance in their lives and in your lives, okay? And then you'll feel that if I don't give my child this toy or this thing that he's asking for, I'm a bad parent, right? So in your back of the mind, you just feel that, right? So how do you now curb that? Because that's not going to help anybody, okay? And I'm sorry, I just put in one slide. These are golden rules for uh, conscious parenting. Children are pure and sacred at birth. Molding them as ideal children is the duty of parents. Okay, there's no getting out of this. Children are gifts of God. Parents should rear them as representatives of God. And when you get the child really to connect, even after a temper tantrum, and you know you can connect with the child and understand what it is, parents, especially mothers, instinctively know he's hungry, he's tired, right? So you want to really understand the child, what it is, and you allow them to blossom when you do that level of acceptance and understanding. Not that they get away with the uh, temper tantrums and you know they, they can you know, get away with whatever they want. No, it's, it's a way to connect with them and know that that temper tantrum is, is not for long. When um, I was doing my 36 hour call duties as a psychiatrist and my, we lived near, near the hospital I trained in in Singapore, um, I used to have to come home because the eldest child, you know, he would throw temper tantrums. He would chase the uh, servants with the, uh, the housekeepers with the knife, bread knife. He was that angry child, you know, and uh, I knew immediately what it was. So I had to come back home and when the, when, when the mates, you know, they would call and say, you know, Ajay is, is, is being terrible and behave, right? I had to come home, put on all the blinds and hug him. I would spend half an hour, 45 minutes, I'm thinking, oh God, you know, how long is this going to take? But I used to like just hug him, just like skin to skin. And this time when he was young, so he'd be fighting away and then after a while, he would just settle down. So a couple of times of doing that and the child used to settle down and never have that kind of violent behavior, especially to the mates. But it took something more in the later years when his frustration came out, it was easy to go and hit his younger brother, right? He was four years younger than him. So anybody have fighting uh, kids at home? Kids fight? Yeah. So there's a lot of frustration coming out of them that they learn to do it to the younger kids, okay? So practicing of the five human values, it's something very important, but as a parent to understand that they're going through a frustration, and sometimes if the child is young enough, you can hug. If there's an older child, you know, you can't, but you can still sit with the child one on one, all right, and talk to the child. So. Parents are sculptors who chisel their children beautifully. Our bringing children starts from the womb. What the mother sees, hears, eats, everything affects the baby. So any of you are parents, you have the next child, you know, consider that very, very, very strongly, okay? Mother is the first teacher. The child learns every act from the mother, and I would add the father as well. First five years, the child learns action from the parents. So be very careful what comes out of your mouth and how you're dealing with the child. No matter how tired and frustrated you are of the day, uh, no excuse, okay? Hold yourself to higher standards and try to relieve your stress, not at the expense of the child. Uh, environment is the first place for the child to learn social behavior. So if the parent or the mother or he sees everybody holding the cell phone and texting, guess what? The child will learn to do that. And especially when you have teenagers, I have a lot of clients who come to see me, their child will not even like look at them. It's very, very rude. And all the time on the earphone. Anybody has children like that or know of children like that? Your kids must be really young. <laughs> because that is a real big problem, right? How do you distinguish? Because their, their friends are all doing it and they have the latest phone, right? So there are ways that you can, you can take that. And they're not doing anything. They, they're just on the computer and on the uh, cell phone. Child's body, health, mind depends on parents' lifestyle. So the key here is how healthy you are. So going, especially the fathers, this is where the fathers and mothers working together, when you engage in sports, you know, uh, walk for human values, whatever it is for service, when you do uh, 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 giving at the soup kitchen, at the shelters, whatever that you decide as a community to give your giving, the child has to see that. The child will also participate in exercises, but that most important thing is they have to see the parents together, especially the fathers, you are also giving to the poor. 
I found that that's the number one thing. And even now, years later, when it was hard to get up the child, children, you know, in bed on Sundays, you know, uh, we belong to the side center here in Norwalk. And, uh, you know, we used to go to the juvenile uh, delinquent home and we were in Boston and, and at the uh, soup kitchen and at the, uh, uh, what do you call it, old, old folks home, right, the senior citizens home. And years later, when my daughter was applying for um, the, 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 the college, she says, Mom, thank you for bringing us to, to volunteer these places because her resume looks so good. Okay? But it wasn't just a resume, you're opening their heart. You can, like, you can balance the materialism by having them act so giving. And they are going to ask you tough questions. Why the homeless family is homeless? Don't be afraid of that kind of questions. Okay? So it's good to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them because they are, they're going to like, I don't want to see this and I, I just want to focus on my life and my family. That's not going to happen to our children. They, we don't know where they're going to go, where they're going to end up in, and it's much better as a parent that we talk to them about these things and that have a faith that, you know, that they can uh, overcome them. That's what we call resilience. Okay? More on that. So blossoming of the child's mind depends on his home filled with diligence, devotion, and faith. Because if you don't give a child faith in themselves and in God, right? They came from God. How else, where else is a child going to get it? So you've got to stop and ask yourself, what are my values? You know, what's my faith? I'm too, it's very difficult for me to go to a temple. I don't understand my religion. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? So that's a real question. Especially as Indian parents, we are here in the US and in Western countries, right? So it's a question you need to ask yourself individually, as a family, and as a community. Where can I find help so that I can teach? And do you know about Chimayananda, the Balvikas? Yeah. How many, how many of you send your children to Balvikas? No. Yeah. And the Satya Sai? Balvikas. Huh? Yeah. So if you don't know what it is, ask around. Is, is how to explain the, the concepts of our religion to simply to the, the children. At one time, I sent my kids to the Chimayananda, you know, Balbikas and the Sai education. <laughs> I needed them to understand that all religious faiths were one, the brotherhood of men and, you know, fatherhood of, of men and brotherhood of, 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 of the community, right? So it was very important for me. So it depends on what's important for you. Okay? What did you say? Sai what? The Sai Center. Sai, uh, Satya Sai Education in Human Values. Uh, you can ask more that. You know? We'll have another session on that. Yeah, we have. <laughs> right? It's the, 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 the Sai Parenting. Very, very important for parents to know what that is about. Because it's, it's all across all denominations. And I wanted my children to attend that. Because I knew that they had to learn about the different religions and the faiths. And, and how do you like, you know, bring to terms with your own life. So conscious parenting supports the idea that there really are no objective rules in the world, that the best position from which the children can make sense of the world is through checking in with your own inner compass. I call it the GPS, God Positioning System. So when it's a conscience, it's divine, it's God, right? So what do you think? When they, even when they do something wrong and they, are, they, are, they, are, they steal or they, they, they lie, you know, and then you ask them, you know, when it's a mom, I'm so stupid. I says, well, okay, but really breathe deep down inside. Does that place say that you're stupid? And then they'll tell you, no. I said, but I have these thoughts that I'm stupid, right? Stupid, bad, whatever. And then they'll say, but sometimes, you know, we have thoughts. We have so many thoughts. We don't have to believe all of them. Okay? And Mommy, then, oh, I just blow it out. This okay? And the child will say, oh, I feel better. Okay, practice the breathing out the bad thoughts. Okay, especially thoughts of self-criticism, because that's something that you can nip in the bud when you see it, and it won't last very long, okay? The idea may sound very radical, idealistic, or even naive. Surely children need some rules and uh, 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 beliefs in order to feel safe and secure. It's yes and a no, okay? It's how you practice it. Children need the answer, but the question is where to read those insights. So when you tell them something, you have to sit with them and see that they understand what it is, because if they're doing it out of fear for you, that you are an authoritative parent and you told them you better do this, uh, they may pretend to agree because they don't want to upset you, but behind your back, they'll do all kinds of nasty things. Mommy, I okay? A lot of the fighting that goes out in the home is because they learn it from the argument with the parents. I'm sorry to say this, so they do it on their younger siblings. So if you have a, a disagreement with your spouse, take it behind closed doors. 
Okay, but children know that, and then you can just be the truth. You know, daddy and mommy are, uh, ama and papa, or whatever you call. You know, we are, we are, we are disagreeing on something, but you know, it doesn't affect you because they get frightened that you know it affects them that they are guilty. Okay, so that's how we should be like really aware of why we are doing what we are doing to the children. Now, if children are allowed to fully discover who they are and being accepted in the process of that. The likelihood of a happier, more conscious way of living is much higher. At least that's my experience. So that they, whatever they have to say. So Sonia, for example, when she was 11, 12 years old, she was chubby, a little bit chubby. And uh, she started getting into this, um, when we eat organic food, Sonia. At that time, I wasn't into organic. <laughs> my daughter is my first teacher. I said, Sonia, why do you want to eat only organic foods? And mom, do you know all the other foods? This was, you know, when she was 11, 12, she's uh, 30 years old now, right? And she could have a good conversation. She was, you know, exercising herself. And she says, Mom, you need to lose weight. And these are all the exercises. And my friends used to love her so much. They said, Sonia, can I sign up as a, can you, can you be my personal trainer? And she had that gift, you know. And, and for years, she had that. She, it was just natural of her. And so we encouraged a child to, to teach us. So all my children, as your children, you, many of you will develop that, that trust, they are your first teachers. They really teach you a lot about yourself. And so don't be quick to judge and say no, because it was really, you know, I was cooking for the family or, you know, and then for her was separate with organic foods and she was cooking herself. But later I realized how much of sense that was. Okay, so that's an important thing. And you have to talk to your child, spend time with your child. All right, one-on-one. -on -one. I had a husband who, father who came and said, you know, we go for parties, they're Indians, and, and during the parties, you know, I see, said, but I'm not spending time with the child. He had a lot of guilt. And I said, well, if you're seeing the children there, take yourself away from your group of friends and go play with them, right? Sometimes when you go to the Wilton Temple, how many of you know Wilton Temple? You know, you see the children running around, right? They're a danger to themselves. They fall down and then, you know, the parents don't know what to do. One parent, I was telling the organizers and poor Swamiji, you know, that, you know, one parent has to be with the child. And then they take turns, one hour, half an hour, whatever you want. And you, you, you develop some interesting games that the child wants. Boys will have some games, girls will want some games. Because you cannot leave children at that age by themselves. In a group, there is one thing we call herd mentality. And as you start understanding the, the growth of these children, that's a certain age group that the herd, they are like, they do unbelievable things, naughty things. So when they do one by one, they're good children, but when you put them in, in a group, they misbehave themselves. So you need to be aware of two steps ahead of them, at least one step ahead of them, and just bring some order and some, you know, and some children are especially naughty. It means they need more attention. That's all it means. So you give them some tasks to do and make leaders out of them. And you know, not bullying leaders, but real leadership. You give them some role and you praise them. You appreciate them. Oh, he's good. Or when we used to have the, the, the kids, you know, the party, you know, everybody would win a prize. Something small, they don't care. It's just that they're being acknowledged, right? So they love that. A self-consciousness is a pretty powerful main ingredient in the recipe for a long-term happier and easier life. So this is like being allowed to discover who they are, being accepted in the process, is like it's a very, very important. Not to be quick to blame the child, but first, you know, say, I'm angry. So understand the source of your anger and frustration, and say, the child is not responsible for my insecure feelings, for my anger. Only my feelings and my thoughts in the moment, which I hope we can get to, okay? Uh, to share with that more with you. So what are our roles as our parents, as, as parents? To be our own best friend and help ourselves first. And then only can we truly be there for the children, right? Because of what I am is what I give to the world. Am I love? I give love. If I'm frustrated and confused, I give up frustration and confusion, right? And then I blame them and say, why are they not listening to me, <laughs> you know? Conscious parenting is a continuous focus on loving. It's continuous. Not that you did it yesterday, you have to do it today. Every hour of the moment, you have to like check in where you are, investigating and healing your own self, which then positively spills over into the children and the family, all right? It seems to be a simple mechanism of self-love. It just spills over. So how do you do self-love? You know, the guiding message for conscious parenting. To earn real respect, you should do what you say, First, be. Second, do. Right? And third, you tell. So be, do, and then tell. Without the first be, the be is being. If you're not being love, and you can't do things with love, you can't tell them, go love your brother. <laughs> you, you don't feel it, you know, inside. 
And uh, in a nutshell, conscious parenting is a step to self fulfillment. And when I realized that, that opened my heart up. And I said, well, what do we do? And so, you know, once I started that path, and then I didn't expect myself to fall so sick when I decided to stay here. But, you know, it was a process of happening. And I said, you know what? It, it's a direction to take, and it helps the whole family. My husband and I are good, ex husband and I are good friends now. The, I said the two older children are married, the third one is getting married, you know, he is so supportive and he lives in Singapore, right? He comes back and visits them and they visit him. They can't go to Singapore because the boys didn't do national service, but they go to uh, different countries and they spend wonderful holidays together, okay? So it is possible when you stand, like, you know, when your children can tell you, mom, you're not being in integrity, don't be afraid of it. I said, okay, Ajay, what is that? I'm not being integrity. And then have a conversation about that, right? Mom, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Okay, what did I not do what I said I would do? So open the doors to communicate with them because they may have a point, right? And you want to hear what the message is that they want to say. So practical examples, we may not go into all that. When what you're in your mind, you tend to follow ideas that people have laid out. Uh, when you apply force, a harsh voice, bribes or threats, you apply techniques to control your kid, or as, uh, I, I love this Alfie Cohn's work, he was the one who coined conscious parenting, uh, do to your child. So we don't want to do to our child. Uh, uh, the bullying, the, the harsh words, the discipline, in the name of a discipline, no, that's doing to a child. What you want to do opposite is work with the child, okay? Uh, physically Mommy, doing something, uh, this one I like, leaving your child to fall asleep crying because you've been told that it's the right way to force autonomy and independence uh, through doing to your child, okay? No, because later on, no matter how exhausted they are, they have difficulty sleeping because they remember my parents used to chuck me in a dark room and I had to be alone and I'm scared. And so a lot of children start sleeping later and later and you know, they, they just don't want to go to bed. And I have somebody who is in his you know, 20s and still has to have light all over the, the bedroom because he's scared of being left alone, right? So we are at a very, very precious stage with our child, children. And you know, be careful what kind of behaviors you're instilling in them. If you come from love, it's fine. You don't put force on the child. Is that clear? Okay. So Junior, unless you eat your spinach, you can't have your dessert. So this is what we always say to our kids, right? <laughs> but you don't understand that there, there is a threat there. You see how parents <laughs> cleverly control their kids by using <laughs> threats neatly waved into a bribe. Be very, very conscious of that. So what can we do instead, right? We don't want to do this, you know, eat this, because I had a son, my son, youngest one, they killed, right? He used to clear his uh, vegetables on the plate, and, and if you looked under the plate, you know, the, 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 uh, under the tablecloth, all the vegetables were there. <laughs> I don't know how he got it, because it was right in front of my eyes, but he managed to sneak it in there. He didn't want to eat it, right? So how to find a clever way how to get the vegetables into him, right? The matter is getting it into him. You don't have to force him to eat it in that form the vegetables took. He didn't like that, right? So what did he like? Pizza. So I used to make pizza and put vegetables and grind the sauce, you know, make it boil it, grind it, and then put it as pizza sauce with lots of tomato. He ate the vegetable sauce, right? So we can always do that to our children. Now the children don't think that they don't know what you're doing, but they kind of, uh, Okay, that was not meat because I'm a vegetarian, so I would use the mock meat or you know. So it's mom, it tastes funny, <laughs> and I see you're eating that. Now kids are smarter than you, okay? They can pick it up, but the fact that you know they eat it, they understand it, and says, well, I'm trying to you know not kill the animals. <laughs> so you know that's a dialogue that you can have, and you do it with lots of funny and humor, right? Now the important thing is when you have a child that is throwing a temper tantrum and you want to use this discipline of a threat or a force. The important thing to remember as a children is you change the scenery, right? You bring them quickly to another room. If there's a child that you can pick up, they, they will like, oh, it's a change of physical scenery. They will forget. And they say, oh my God, you see that uh, a caterpillar right there? Or that worm? Oh my God, look at that lizard out there, right? And the child is like captivated because you took them out of that first environment where the crying temper tantrums was going, and then you gave them something else. And then, you know, sometimes you may have to feed the child, right? If it's a young enough child. Right? So there's so many things that we can do when we are creative and we know the child and what's going on, okay? So trust your intuition, trust what's going on inside you. So I give you some practical examples. Be conscious of the food that you give to the child. So if he doesn't like you know, vegetables or things in some way, find another way to do it, 
okay? Um, eating habit is a very, very good thing. So experiencing the sleep time. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to be so strict. Okay, give them half an hour in the, in the, just half an hour. And so they know that you're giving, you're not giving in to them. And especially when you have a sleepover with other children, make sure that the children have the rules, you know, that we're going to bed at this time. And they will try to bargain and bargain. So you just give them another 10, 15 minutes. That's it. <laughs> and says, okay, time's up. You know, just close lights. Okay, so we have to put the discipline, but do it with love and do it with humor. Okay, uh, so want your child's confidence? Stop judging. Okay, stop judging them. So, but when you see something, you know, and you don't criticize them, and then you just take them aside, especially if it's with a group of children, don't humiliate them in front of children and adults. You take them quietly to one side and, and tell them, look, this is not a good behavior. Tell them back at home. Right? So. Teaching a child with love, they learn to respect you much later. Years later, just a couple of years ago, my daughter called me, you know, when she was, you know, in college, she says, Mom, you know, when she's saying that voice, Mom, you know, and I go, what, what have I done now? <laughs> and I said, Mom, you never disciplined us. I said, really, Sonia? Because, you know, there was some, some issues with Sonia. I said, yeah, you didn't discipline us. You know, you have to discipline children. She didn't know how much, like, you know, when I wanted discipline and I was going through this, I had to find a mentor and I had to talk to people. And then, you know, a beautiful uh, student, and I was a student professor at Columbia, the PhD student was, was my mentor in a program that I was engaged in. And she told me, you know, Vijay, and these young people, you know, they, she's just like you. You know, so you're, you're seeing a mirror image and that, like, threw me on and said, oh my God, she is. When she was being defiant and, you know, I thought was rude. She was exerting her independence because you have to have a child exert the independence to survive in the world, right? I cannot just bring them down. And so I was saying, how do I treat my younger self? Well, I was a very quiet child. I was very obedient to my parents. I did everything they wanted, right? So how would I treat myself if I had more uh, confidence and freedom at that age? So you have to ask yourself this question, especially if you have a very stubborn child. Anybody have stubborn children? <laughs> very good. So these are mini yous. Okay, so talking to them and being firm, but just one look and saying, you know, when she used to come down to the temple, for example, and have very short mini skirts, and I was like, Sonia, you need to go upstairs and change. You know, and mom, it's okay. I said, so I didn't lose my cool, I just looked at her, and you know, then she went up and she, and then she came back home with a shorter skirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they're testing your boundaries. You don't want to get ruffled, you can laugh inside, you know, it's like, yeah, just testing my boundaries, you know? So it's like, no, that's not what I'm you know, doing. So then she came with a, with a, with a long dress, so whatever. Do, do you see? So children are going to test your boundaries. So if you know that's going to happen, Right, and that's going to develop your sense of laughter and, and, and this thing. And, and when I started meditating, Sonia was like, Mom, you need to go to meditate. You didn't meditate today. <laughs> How my three kids used to do that. I said, Okay, I think you're right. I didn't meditate. So I would go meditate and I'll come back and say the answer is still the same, but I would be calmer when I say it. And now I could use it to my daughter, Sonia, you didn't meditate. Now you got to go meditate because when she comes down and after she meditates, oh my God, tons of wisdom coming from her. Right? So children have their moments when they connect to themselves. It could be just 10 minutes, right? Learning to teach them how to meditate means parents have to meditate. Mona, you want to say something about meditation and what happens uh, to the children and to your family? It just takes five more minutes.
I mean, it's not about like meditating, but what becomes available from meditation is you know yourself so much more. And they, like at the eight year old and five year old, they know their feelings, like how Vichya was saying that the thoughts, right? I mean, they have called it as the term kun kun. So when they are angry, they would, I would ask them, Ria, are you your real Ria or this is the kun kun Ria that's talking? And she would say, no, that's the kun kun. So when they become angry or when they are cranky, just having them, just asking them that, is this really the true Ria that I know? And they'll be completely like telling you. It's amazing that how much they have, like when they fall in the school or when they feel anything, all they do is they breathe. That's the first thing they do. And when the older one is getting hurt or when the second one, the, the other person would be like, Didi, Bhagwanji saved you today. Like, so these are little things which I really, really feel that how important it is to be the role model for them. And it doesn't come right away. We as the parents have really, really have played an important role. I would have not been here and sharing the same thing if I would have not meditated myself or if I would have not done the inner work. So, thank you. So do you see how much it takes to do the inner work? So finding a teacher and working with them one-on-one -on -one is very important, especially when you want to raise successful, confident, resilient children. You have to have a, a, a practice inside that you, know, you are comfortable with. Okay, so I, I want to, it's eight o'clock, so I want to be mindful of the time. Anybody has any questions so far? How to direct a teenager in the right direction? In the sense, like sometimes it is a fight with a teenager. I don't know because they are changing his mind, everything. It's getting difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You follow the five human values and sit down and talk to them, be honest with them. If your fears are there, you're, you're talking to them, but very important to have that communication. Okay? Um, are we going to continue this? Yes, we are up for it. We can have. Uh, we just did half of it. Anybody of wants that next week? Yeah, yeah we would yeah. love yeah. to have yeah. that. So I want more interactive, so we'll finish part of that. Okay? So uh, for those of you who want to get the newsletter and those of you who want a one on one session, you know, just write it. I have very limited time, so I'll just, you know, check for, for the dates that I can give you. Okay? But thank you so much. So let's continue next week. Bring your questions. Okay? Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.